Good afternoon and welcome to Media Life from the News Hub here at Adesawe in Kanda, Accra. I am Wendy Laya. Headlines for this afternoon. Accra High Court grants states an interlocutory injunction filed. First, we start with the International Child Labor Day. And we'll bring you some more updates on officials of the National Education Authority begin registration for members of parliament for the Ghana Cuts after no show yesterday. And U.S. President Donald Trump says his historic talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that ended in a joint agreement was tremendous. We have details of these stories and many more lined up. Do stay with us. Let's start with our stories. Now, a large proportion of children in the Savannah regions of Ghana continue to be engaged in labor at the expense of education. As the Child Labor Day is marked, Peter Koradato visited the northern region and reports children are engaged in varying forms of labor when they were supposed to be in school. Ghana Statistical Service Survey published in April 2015 showed 1.9 million children between the ages of 5 to 17 are involved in child labor. 1.2 million of them are engaged in hazardous labor. 26.3% engage in economic activities while attending school with 41.6% not going to school at all. Research also has found children in rural savannah areas than those in rural forest and coastal areas to be participating in economic activities. Unfortunately, as these children engage in hazardous work, they are exposed to workplace abuse. A drive through part of the northern region confirmed the report. During school hours on Thursday and Friday, we encountered a number of children either working as head boy or engaged in varying forms of labor. From Nawuli along the White Volta through Tamale, Yendi to Samboli on the Oti River, one can count a significant number of children in varied forms of labor on the field. The story wasn't any different in other parts of the northern region. Some of the children were easy in a way in the villages with no concern for school. This girl told us she dropped out of school at primary five on the instruction of her mother but was unable to explain why. She and others who have never been to school now find solace in washing clothes in the OT River all day. This boy leads his cattle to graze here on the Samboli RC Busy School compound at a time his peers were in class and the National Youth Coordinator at the Ghana National Association of Teachers was worried. The statistics we have from the Ghana Statistical Service indicate that out of every five children you see, one is into child labor. So if you have five children and one is into child labor, the question is, the, those that are in child labor today, in the year, I mean, at the 20 years to come, there will be no work for them. The development is partially blamed on lack of teachers infrastructure and learning materials. We don't have uh, staff. We are insufficient to... Our classes, some of the classes have to be combined. We pay per two, one teacher per two classes. We sometimes some classes have to be vacant for some time. But the National Youth Coordinator at the NAT Secretariat, Thomas Musa, wants teachers to do more to reduce the trend and get children into the classrooms. Even if the child wants to be coming, a carpenter, let the child become architect so that we, they can give us quality service. Thomas Musa appealed to duty bearers to act in the interest of children to save the future of the country. So today, globally, we're marking Child Labor Day. And with me here in the studio is James Kofian, and he is the president of Challenging Heights. Good afternoon, James. Good afternoon. And thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you. For now, you just me. watched a story from the northern region. Yes. It seems the situation will just not go away. What do you make of what you saw? Well, it's, um, 
a definition of our failure, our collective failure. Um, the, at the district level, the district is supposed to uh, design their own medium term development plans. And you have to uh, identify the situation, the problem that you have in your district in order to capture them in your district plan. Mm. Now, I would imagine that if you know you have a problem of child labor in your district, you will capture it there and allocate funds in addressing them. But in Ghana, I'm telling you, in most of the districts, they don't even capture child labor in their medium term. Is that not because plan. we think it's a normal thing for children to work? It's because we don't care. You know, it's because, you know, our penchant is that we, we delight in seeing children being abused and out of school than, you know, we wanting to do something about it. We just don't care. And then we come out, today is a World Day Against Child Labor. Mm -hmm. you, would, you listen to the speeches that will come, very large speeches. We we'll do all the speeches and after that we go back and, and then sleep. Mm -hmm. So it's just a matter of the fact that we don't care. Now, the theme for this year is resist child labor, improve the safety and health of young workers towards achieving SDG goal 8. Mm -hmm. And the national purpose is, among others, to sensitize the general public and stakeholders to take action against child labor. Yes. Like you mentioned, speeches, speeches, speeches. Mm -hmm. Have we not done enough talk when it comes to issues relating to, uh, relating to child labor? We have done more than enough talk. It's time for action. The World Day Against Child Labor is championed by the Child Labor Unit of the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations. The only activity that I know them to be doing, and they have done in the past, has been the annual 12 June event, as we are doing today, and then the creation and launching of the National Plan of Action. After the National Plan of Action has been launched, no activity whatsoever is done. They sit in Accra, they don't go to the district. We are talking about over 1.9 million children who are caught up in child labor nation, nationwide. Mm -hmm. I would imagine that today being the World Day Against Child Labor, we will take the day as a stock-taking day to tell us how many of the 1.9 million children that the National Statistical Service has put out there that you have rescued into safety. How many of them are in school? and what effort you are making in order to get the rest back into school. Mm -hmm. You just ig ignore that bit of your responsibility, but then go to a Deborah ground and give a very long speech that has nothing to do with the sufferings of those children who are out of school. It is like we are acting as irresponsible as the parents who are also neglecting their children. Now, you're a major stakeholder when it comes to some of these concerns. Yeah. You mentioned early on that it is a national and collective failure. Yes. You raised some of these concerns. Yes. How are you pushing the ministry to ensure that some of these things are achieved? I've done that. I mean, I'm sure you've been following me. Uh, I have said that we should remove the child labor, labor unit from the Ministry of Employment and Labor Relations and put it under the Ministry of Gender. Because that's where the Human Trafficking Secretariat is situated. In that case, we will be able to coordinate effectively, because you are not talking about trafficking, it's also child labor. So we'll be able to coordinate effectively. In addition to maximizing the use of the little resources that we have. Apart from that, when you are fighting an issue as big as we are talking about, you know we have about 6 million children in this country. And if you have 1.9 million out of those children being victims of child labor, then the situation is really bad. You don't become tokenistic when you are fighting a problem as big as that. Don't just say it with your mouth. You have a national plan of action that was launched first in 2010, which you didn't deliver on which expired in 2015. Now you're supposed to launch the phase two of that in 2016, which you didn't do. You only launched that phase two last month, this year. Within those two national plan of action, you have certain actions that you have to undertake. You didn't take in, undertake any of them. And yet you went ahead to launch the second phase. So it's like those days when we were children in school. You have not taken your bath, but you want to uh, apply for me. But so how do we That's deal? You, you mentioned the issue over and over again. How do we deal with this? 
You is that the ministry is not listening or government as a whole is not listening? What exactly do we do? For me, my recommendation is one of them is what I told you. Move the, the child labor unit to Ministry of Gender. Then the second thing is enforce the law. You have the, um, the Children's Act that prohibits child labor. So make sure that you have enforced the law. If the parent is not sending the child to school, make sure that the parents send the child to school. And if they insist, punish them by letting them go to jail or something. It will serve as a deterrent. Mm. Also, you have made basic education free. So the parent has no excuse in saying that I will not send my child to school. So if you have made the infrastructure available, the classrooms, the teachers, everyone is available, and the parent who is supposed to also deliver on his or her mandate is not sending the child to school, you have a moral courage to punish that parent. Okay. Fatherly irresponsibility. If you don't allow me to say this, then you kill me. In our work that we do, in about 95% of the case, all the children we have rescued from slavery and trafficking situation, including child labor, the fathers have neglected the children. And then the burden then falls on the mothers. And when the mothers are over bloated and overburdened, they also sell their children mm. just to relieve their pains. Get those fathers who are irresponsible to jail. All right. Well, thank you so much, James Kofian. And he's a president of Challenging Heights, and we're looking at some um, child labor. Are you still watching? Midela, we'll bring you more of that in our subsequent bulletins. Let's look at other stories now. And an Accra High Court has granted the state an interlocutory injunction filed to stop officials of the Ghana Football Association from carrying themselves as officers of the association. The attorney general in a submission said the officers, if allowed, will use the premises to carry out and illegality. My colleague Godfred Tanam is in court and he joins me via phone. Hello, Godfred. Good afternoon, Godfred. Uh, good afternoon. Now, what's the latest on this case? Yeah, so uh, the uh, court has granted an injunction uh, uh, in favor of the state and then against the officers and uh, of uh, GFA, that is, uh, anybody who has something to do with the uh, football in the country and they're connected with GFA. So now they have no right to go to the uh, offices of the GFA or the premises, go closer to the offices because the court says that they have, they, I mean, they, they, the injunction is saying that they should not get closer to the premises because according to the uh, uh, Attorney General, uh, that is uh, Gloria Kofu, who was in court herself, uh, if uh, the officers are allowed to go to the court, that, I mean, to the premises of the GFA, uh, it means that they are going to continue perpetrating the illegality that were, 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 I mean, was captured in the uh, video of the NAS uh, expose. So uh, according to her, because they want to stop that, they want to stop the uh, officers from carrying out more illegality, uh, the court should place an injunction on them. And that is exactly what the court has done. All right. Well, thank you so much, Godfrey Sonam, for that update. You bring us some more in our subsequent bulletins. And to another trending story, and thanks to social media, that the poster was shared some few hours after his father's death. In grieving wife and angry son have got the nation discussing again the deteriorating health service system but they are not only going to mourn and rant they will take legal action if need be over the system that failed them miserably when they needed it the most johnny hughes spoke to the wife and son of the late prince antonio pokwe champong the 70 year old man who was refused a hospital bed from seven different hospitals and died her pot with which she fetches water to quench her thirst has been broken, her backbone has been damaged, the mighty tree under which she seeks shade has been cut off, and it is because of a system that is non-functional. But mommy, Pacho, Kafra, and Yako, shedding, shedding. When you feel she say, Senior doctor for near nurse for any medical system, senior or muye juma any. Si si ye doctor zani ye nurse for ni omo mwa ye kra omo mwa omano kra bibi. Currently, our doctors and nurses are not helpful to the nation at all. 
We blame government, but the problem is really us. <laughs> <laughs> my mom had cried and cried and cried on her knees she had to go back into the car because there was nothing she could also do at the moment and so she went to sit by my dad again and all i could hear is say that kwami umba u papa home na eba fomo eba fomo eba afa me ntibio mo she had then put her left ear on my dad's chest so i rushed into the car put my my hand on his you know uh, you know to test his pulse and it wasn't pumping. So I went back to the doctor and said that my dad's pulse is not pumping. Please check up on him, for, on, on, on him for me. That was when he put the device in his ear and put it on his chest, shook his head, opened his right eye and said he was dead. And all through these hospitals, there's no bed. There's no bed and not even a paracetamol was administered. It's sad. I wrote um, a write-up, pasted it on my wall on Facebook. Because that was the next, my next resort. I wrote it at 5.45, 5.45 a.m. Posted it. Two hours later, to three hours, I checked my Facebook and I, I realized that about um, 500 to 700 comments had come. Just within that short time. About 85% of the people who commented on that post were all saying that this has happened to me. This has happened to my mom. This has happened to my uncle. A lot of them were saying that similar things had happened to them. So the question was, so how long will this keep happening? This is criminal in the sense that negligence, medical negligence, is an act of, of crime. Many more of that story as well. You're still watching Midday Live. And former President John Dramani Mahama has expressed lack of confidence in the Trump administration and its foreign affairs policy in the relation to Africa, speaking at a public discussion on U.S. Africa relations organized by the Institute of Economic Affairs. He bemoaned the lack of a senior officer for African affairs two years into the Trump administration. President Trump's alleged description of African countries as shithole resulted in public condemnation globally. Former U.S. Secretary of State Rex Tillerson was fired when concluding his Africa tour in 2018. The news of his firing came through a tweet posted by President Donald Trump. Such incidents have caused many to question the level of commitment of the U.S. president towards U.S.-Africa affairs. Speaking at a public discussion on U.S.-Africa relations organized by the Institute of Economic Affairs, IEA, former President John Mahama noted the protectionism policy of the Trump administration is leading to America losing the soft power it has long been known for. U.S. has been the leading world power and most of the world has looked up to the U.S. in times of crisis. That appears to be changing. If you're going to be methodical, and transactional in dealing with your relationships with the rest of the world, then you lose the value of that soft power that everybody has had always looking to America when there's been, you know, issues uh, to deal with. And President John Mahama further expressed lack of confidence in the Trump administration and its handling of foreign affairs in relation to Africa. He noted any agreement formed between North Korean leader Kim Jong-un and U.S. President Donald Trump during the summit on June 12 is uncertain in view of the tendency of Trump to fall out of agreements such as the Paris Accord and Iran nuclear deal. I mean, the whole world came together and uh, fashioned out the climate change agreement. America, which was one of the major prime movers in helping get this agreement, walks away from the agreement. What guarantees that King Jong-un have that if he reaches agreement on denuclearization, you know, tomorrow America will not walk away from the agreement. Former Assistant Secretary of State in the Bureau of African Affairs, Ambassador Dr. Ruben Bridgetty, noted the inability of the United States to prioritize its relations with Africa under the Trump administration will be to its own disadvantage. The U.S. must reorient its engagement to be more relevant on a regional and multilateral basis in Africa. Wherever possible, it should align its own interests and objectives to those identified by African countries and multilateral institutions. 
It must identify circumstances where African partnerships with other non-African countries or entities are contrary to U.S. interests. It also must identify those places where such partnerships are in support of U.S. interests. U.S. Ghana relations spans over 60 years. Officials of the National Identification Authority have begun registering members of parliament for the Ghana Cuts after the no-show yesterday. The minority who earlier said they will boycott the process postponed a media briefing scheduled for today. Meanwhile, the NIA officials are expected to brief members in a committee on the whole. Our reporter cutting from Moi is in parliament and joins us live process for the national identification card is ongoing. The process which started at 10.30 is still on and so far uh, we just had the first MP to receive his card, uh, the MP for Achuma Kwauma. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You started at 10.30, it's over 12 and you just had your card. Yes, I started at a bit earlier but then it's taking a bit of time because they were then about to set it up. They weren't used to the system. And now that they've set it up, I believe that uh, things will normalize and uh, the process will be faster. It's a very long, tall process. Which, which aspect of the process do you think uh, took so much time? Well, the first point is to fill the form. And filling the form, you need some requirements. And uh, I didn't have all the requirements. For instance, the digital address was not ready, readily available. Um, I needed my SNET number. I needed um, even the, 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 my, my tin and a whole lot of things that must be available and I didn't have them ready and that is one of the reasons why probably the whole process got a bit longer. But there had been um, prior information that this exercise was starting today. Is it that you didn't know the things that were required? Well, um, I'm, I was aware but I didn't pay attention, enough attention to what I needed to and bring along with me and uh, it's, it's also something that probably we need, uh, we need to do we need to conduct a lot of education because um, it's something that probably um, the, the NIE needs to do conduct a lot more education because um, most of the people will not be aware of the sort of things that they need to come along with Can we see your, your Ghana uh, this is my Ghana card and I'm happy to get uh, this Ghana card to be one of the first people to hold this Ghana card and it's very very important and uh, it's quite good that uh, I'm happy to have this card. Okay. Yeah. Thank you very much and that was the MP for Achima Kwauma. He is actually the first MP to receive his card today. As I said earlier the process started at 10.30 and he just had his card but according to him uh, some of the information needed to fill out the forms were not readily available and perhaps that accounted for the long time spent over there. Meanwhile the minority in parliament still stand by their decision not to participate in this exercise. What they see say is that um, they still have some issues when it comes to the whole process, talking about the cost procurement issues as well as uh, issues that has to do with the proof of identification. And so they are still waiting to hear from the National Identification Authority and then if they are satisfied with the reasons or explanations they give, then they may consider whether or not to be part of this exercise. Let me also ask that executives of the National Identification Authority are already in the House and we are all waiting for them to have that meeting with Parliament at the Committee of the Whole so that we'll carry on from there. Thank you very much. Over to you in the studio. Thank you very much indeed, Kathleen, for that update. But let's hear from the minority on their take on the Ghana cards. The minority, until we take the briefing, and ask the necessary questions and get the answers, we are not participating. So if we have the briefing and we are satisfied with the answers to our question and the other suggestions, obviously we will participate. But if not, we will not be participating. What specific issues are you still not clear with? Well, we have just I think, about four issues. Statement by leading members of the NDC, including former President Mahama and the mi minority leader, that... Ghanaians are going to be disenfranchised. It can never be true because the law as amended 
took care of every citizen of Ghana, regardless of how literate or illiterate you are. The whole registration process, like we are witnessing, one, is going to capture Ghanaians living in Ghana and abroad, and also foreigners living in Ghana. It's the kind of thing they would need here today to register members would be a Ghanaian passport, a voter's ID or birth certificate or both, as well as um, digital house numbers or address systems of the various where the, uh, the registrars are coming from. So that is it here from the Parliament House. We will be bringing you updates as to what happens, whether or not the minority is still boycotting the exercise or they have rescinded that decision. But that can only happen after officials of the National and Education Authority have a meeting with Parliament as a committee of the whole to decide discuss the various issues that have been raised in the course of this exercise from the Parliament House of Ghana. Catherine Shripoma for TV3 News. To some more stories, and President of Guinea, Alpha Conde, is in the country to confer with President Ekufado on new timelines for the resumption of talks in Togo aimed at finding a lasting solution to political impasse in that country. President Ekofado for the past few months has been leading mediation talks between government and opposition in the French West African country. The former African Union chairman Alpha Conde is in the country to confer with President Ekofado on the ongoing political crisis in Togo. At the last ECOWAS summit held in the Togolese capital, Lome, the ECOWAS head of state nominated President Alpha Conde to join President Ekofado in the mediation process he had initiated to get the government of Togo and the opposition in that country to find an amicable solution to their differences. The two leaders met behind closed doors. Time now for your take and on MTN video report today, Wisdom Anand reports and expresses his gratitude to TV3 after his first story on a wrongly cited electricity pole has been repositioned at Old Ningo in the Greater Accra region. Thank you, TV3, for reporting our main problem. Now the light pole has been removed from the road. And this is the new one that has been changed. As you can see on your screen, this pole was brought in to replace the one that was in the road. And as you can see, it is here gently, and every vehicle will have their way to pass without delay, interfering with the pole accident. Once again, I'm an Anand Wisdom, reporting from Bumuno, Old Ningo. You can also send your video reports via WhatsApp platform the 05514 Still watching Media Live to stay with us. Thanks for staying. You're still watching Media Live. Let's do business now. And the Director of Capital Markets at First Bank, Winslow Sakifu, has underscored the need for government to take urgent steps to control the city's recent fluctuation, which he says poses a big risk to government's debt sustainability agenda due to the high exposure of the nation's public debts to foreign investors. which was down from 56% in 2016, while the dollar-denominated debt formed 65% of external debt stock, which also dropped marginally from 69% in 2016. Despite government reducing the component of foreign debt due to the high exposure to foreign investors, any depreciation in the local currency automatically increases the debt stock, even if there is no new borrowing. As at May 7, 
the city was trading at four cities, 41 pesos, but by June 7, it had depreciated by 0.7% to four cities, 44 pesos. The central bank has already assured that the changes in the exchange rate is temporary, hence we'll soon see some stability. But speaking on TV3's business analysis program, Business Focus, Director of Capital Markets at First Bank, Winslow Sakifio says the central bank must strategize to ensure a halt in the depreciation of the local currency. When you look at the official depreciation figures uh, using interbank, it's less than 1%. But when you come to the forex, we are seeing something close to 4 3 4%. The issue is all our debts that are denominated in foreign currency, if the city is weakening, then the burden goes up. Not just that we had to convert CD to pay the dollar debt, but then we'll be converting at very, very low rates for the CD. So it's having an impact, especially when we have a situation where our debt stock is also growing. So that's something we would have to be very careful about. And the Volatility in the city will not help the situation that much as we go forward. Winslow Sakifio was of the view that the economic fundamentals have not shown any weaknesses in recent months. He argued that with such fiscal consolidation, the depreciation of the city could be fueled by external forces that may lead to speculation. The Minister of Food and Agriculture is to recruit 2,700 agricultural extension officers for the Planting for Food and Jobs program. Sector Minister Dr. Owusu Ifriya Kuto made this known at the presentation of vehicles by the Canadian government to the Ministry of Agriculture here in Accra. The Planting for Food and Jobs PFJ program is a Government of Ghana program aimed at promoting growth in food production and creating jobs across the country. One of the pillars of the program is to revamp extension services. The Minister of Food and Agriculture, Dr. Uusufi Yakoto, said government is set to embark on the recruitment of some 2,700 agricultural extension officers. We have had to go to cabinet for approval to employ nearly 3,000 officers to come back into the system to, to reawaken extension services. The approval has been uh, given to us in the last month or so, and recruitment is going to start. He bemoaned the poor state of extension services in the country and explained that the recruitment would support farmers to improve food production. We know the link between the farmer and technology is through extension. Unfortunately, the extension services of this ministry has been run down completely over the years. The minister stressed the commitment of his ministry to restoring extension services in order to support farmers and modernize agriculture. The Canadian government has presented 216 vehicles to the Ministry of Agriculture through the Modernization in Agriculture Ghana MAC program. The vehicles are expected to boost the activities of various district agricultural offices to support the planting for food and jobs program. To modernize and mechanize agriculture has introduced various initiatives, among which is the Planting for Food and Jobs PFJ program. As part of logistics required by districts to implement this program, the Minister of Food and Agriculture, Dr. Owusu Efri Yakutu, handed over the keys to 216 vehicles to officials of the ministry. He explained that the vehicles will boost the activities of district officers. So with this Canadian intervention, I'm very much assured that the planting for food and jobs, which ultimately should reach at least one and a half million farmers directly out of farming population of nearly 5 million by the year 2020, that we can achieve that. The vehicles were procured under the Modernizing Agriculture in Ghana MAG program, which is being supported by the Canadian government. Canada is proud to contribute more than 450 million CDs over five years towards supporting the transformation of the Ghanaian economy and increasing the incomes of thousands of people working in the agriculture sector in Ghana. 
the Canadian government emphasized their commitment to advancing agriculture in Ghana through access to economic inputs. And that's all for business. Let's look at some other stories now. And Deputy Commissioner of Immigration, Erica Fari, says the service will launch a five-year strategic plan which will use ICT to facilitate the smooth running of all immigration services across the country. He spoke on New Day. Issuance of passport falls within the domain of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Absolutely, that's true. It's not. But then we have built expertise over the years. Mm. And so we assist them. Okay. What we're trying to do with the ICT okay. is to be able to network with all the relevant agencies okay. such that immigration can, right in our office, mm. be able to assess data on the passport okay. at the passport office. Right. NIE, we will have to also network with them. GIPC, Ghana National Investment Promotion okay. Council. Right. And all the relevant agencies. Okay. So the ICT is, to make it easy, mm. we can publish sensitize the public okay. using the media. Right. The media also gives us feedback. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you are able to get feedback. People can call in into the program. Mm -hmm. They can assess What's immigration. What's up, Twitter and everything Everything. Else. So mm -hmm. the media is very, very key to the successful implementation of the program. This is Media Live. We have more shortly. On international news this afternoon, U.S. President Donald Trump says his historic talks with North Korean leader Kim Jong-un that ended in a joint agreement with tremendous. Now, the signed document includes a pledge for Mr. Kim to rid the North Korean peninsula of nuclear weapons. Mr. Trump later said the U.S. would suspend its military exercises that have infuriated North Korea, which analysts see as an apparent concession. It was the first time a sitting U.S. president met a North Korean leader. The pair shook hands, held talks together, and ate lunch accompanied by advisers. It caps a remarkable turnaround for the two, who only last year were engaged in angry threats. The summit centered on nuclear disarmament and reducing tensions. The agreement said the two countries would cooperate towards new relations, while the U.S. would provide security guarantees to North Korea. On nuclear weapons, Mr. Kim reaffirmed his firm and unwavering commitment to complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Observers say the document lacks substance, in particular on how denuclearization would be achieved. But in a media conference after, Mr. Trump went further, unveiling details not in the agreed text. The U.S. would suspend its provocative war games it holds with South Korea, he said, while he added he wanted to see U.S. troops withdrawn from the South Analysts have said this is a major concession. On denuclearization, he said that Mr. Kim had agreed to it being verified, a key U.S. demand ahead of the meeting. Bemba had been found guilty in 2016 of crimes his troops committed in neighboring Central African Republic from 2002 to 2003. His forces sent to quell a coup in CAR committed acts of extreme violence against civilians, crimes which the original judges said Bemba was made aware of but did nothing to stop. The decision to overturn his 18-year sentence was greeted with cheers from his supporters in the gallery. ICC prosecutor Fatal Ben Souda described the ruling as regrettable and troubling. Amnesty International said it was a huge blow for the victims of a horrifying campaign of rape and sexual violence. The former Democratic Republic of Congo vice president is currently waiting for another sentence in a separate case after he lost an appeal against it. He had been sentenced for one year in jail and fined $350,000 for bribing witnesses during his main war crimes trial. Next entertainment and controversial Guinean singer Belinda Nana Ikea Amwa. Known in showbiz as Miss Bell says, the entertainment industry has been lucrative for her to go broke in life. According to the singer, she has made lots of positive investments to secure her future. Hence, she does not see herself struggling for money. Miss Bell noted that she wouldn't describe herself as a very rich person, but she's got enough.
to live a comfortable life as an entertainer. She told an Accra-based radio station, I'm okay when it comes to money. I'm not rich, but okay, and I don't think I will go broke, she said. And the one corner hit maker, Patapa, known as Patapizi, was a toast of the ninth Ghana Meets Niger concert. Spearheading the Ghanaian side, the Swedish bass singer did not only perform his hit song, One Corner, but also showed off his spurs as a great dancer. Here's a report by Ozurai. A special appellation held at his arrival. The party pass soldiers walked him onto the stage. The sight of his religious robe sent the fans agog. Coming through in Anana style, Article 1 joined Patapizi to perform their latest release, The Fin. <laughs> Fans particularly couldn't have enough of the hook of the song, but beyond that, Patapizi had a great time with patrons. Excitement heightened as he showed off his boogain skills. <laughs> Enjoying wild cheers from the elated crowd, Patapizi found a reason to dance. Characterized <laughs> by jerky arm and shoulder movements, the dance moves got fans to fall in love with Patapizi's stagecraft. The big boys, the Kim Promise, um, Stone Boy, they really disappointed me today. But my man for Ghana was Patapa. I mean, we have disrespected his craft from day one, and he has always proven to us that is the ish. And today you saw what he did. He is the one who fought for Ghana. All the people who came, came to joke. So my top three performances, Patapa, <laughs> number one, Whiskey, number two, then Chatawali. Right. Patapa. What is that dance called? <laughs> that was a song with asabi, different style. Ah, I don't know the amount for when you just say ah, na. You know what I'm talking about? I'm saying. So that's how I'm different. Different today, so okay there. Okay. So called there. You say me you say now. Uh huh. I saw no different today, no eh. So called there. All right, so trust Patapa. That'll be all for this afternoon. My name is Wendy Lai. Do have a lovely afternoon. Enjoy the rest of our programs. Good afternoon.